So welcome to this webinar, Frequency-Specific Microcurrent Treat the Cause webinar. Carol has put together some really remarkable information that um, I've never seen presented before. It's going to be a lot packed in here, and we are definitely going to go over an hour. It'll probably be at least 75 minutes, possibly a little bit longer than that. So if you can stick around for that amount of time, that would be very good. We are recording this, and I will send the recording out to people who are registered in case you miss any of it. So first of all, I want to tell you about some upcoming webinar that's happening on February 7th. It's really fun because Carolyn and I have been uh, collaborating, and so I'm introducing her here to the East-West Seminars group. And we had a huge registration today. We had almost 300 people registered for this. And then she's going to bring me and host me on her group for frequency-specific microcurrent. That's going to be coming on for February 7th. So we have a webinar called Microcurrent and Multidimensional Treatment starting on Thursday, February 7th at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll be the instructor, Darren Starwin. It's also free of charge. And here's what will be covered in this upcoming webinar. You'll learn the three major dimensions of therapeutic care, which is third dimensional, physical, fourth dimensional, emotional, and psychic level and fifth dimensional, the spiritual and oneness level. You'll actually learn how you can integrate all those levels with your microcurrent, acupuncture, Western medicine, whatever it is that you do. So that's why it's called multi-dimensional microcurrent. And you'll be able to recognize which dimensions are addressed by microcurrent and FSM, and which dimensions are involved in individual patient cases and which ones to focus on. And then what's most exciting, ways to address all of those dimensions in your clinical work, which can really expand the scope of what you do. So that's going to be coming up on February 7th. So I'm going to go to here. So you can register for that on the website eastwestseminars.com. You'll also receive an email with you know, all the information Carolyn and I have for our follow-up events. So you can look in your email box later on. All right. So um, this webinar is the frequency-specific microcurrent. Hi, everybody. To remind you about with, with frequency-specific, you need to treat the cause, what's causing the patient's problem or the patient's symptoms. So in our realm, there is a... A difference between what the patient's diagnosis is and what the cause is. So the webinar is to remind you about the differences between what you feel with your hands. So FSM is um, uh, we first started out with with um, treating myofascial pain. So you feel tight muscles with your hands. So you think the problem is tight muscles. You think it's the muscles because that's what you feel. But you have to remember the difference between what you know about physiology, anatomy, neurology, pathology, immunology, everyology, and reanalyze the cause. Think about the cause of what's behind what you feel with your hands. So what you feel with your hands, what you think is the problem, we think it's tight muscles, but then the frequency response is going to remind you what might be behind what you think is the problem because it's only the frequency that treats the cause that's going to have an effect. So next. So this webinar is intended for people who have taken the FSM core <coughs> seminar or who are at least familiar with the principles. So um, there's a little note here about how we attach the leads to the wraps. You that's not particularly relevant to this conversation. I just left the pictures in. Um, treating neck and shoulder prone. You gotta tell them next. 
Yeah, next. So treating the neck and shoulder, this is the first. Next, Darren. Yeah, Darren's controlling the slide, so it's a little, a little bit complicated. But treating the neck and shoulder is the first thing we're going to look at. The patient is prone, laying on their stomach. We're using wet towels or wraps. Now look at where the towels are. There's one around the neck, and then there's one across about the mid-back. Then it goes along the side, under the axilla, and then around the upper arm. So you've got the positive leads at the neck and the negative leads down the arm. Why is that? Well, the reason for that is that there are nerves that go from the neck to the shoulder that control the muscle tone absolutely, right? So you have to, if you're going to treat the muscles in the shoulder, you have to be able to treat the nerves that control those muscles. So that is from a FSM perspective. If all you can do is put your thumb in it, your elbow in it, or stick a needle in it, you don't care about the neck if you're working on the shoulder, right? But with FSM, because you can treat the nerve and the muscle at the same time, you want to have the contacts bracketing all of the relevant tissues. So we use wet towels. It's not elegant. Mm, sometimes it's comfortable, sometimes it's not. Okay, so treating the neck and shoulder prone, this is just about patient positioning. And you can read this slide on your own. It'll be on YouTube, which is where we're going to put these slides, I think, or it'll be on Darren's website or our website. Um, once again, you treat from the neck to the shoulder, so you can treat both the neck and shoulder. And next, and the reason we have the contacts at the neck and shoulder is so that we can treat the C5 and 6 nerve root because it innervates virtually every muscle in the shoulder. The C4 and 5 dermatome, if you look on that dermatome map, um, if you look on the dermatome map, it's um, C4 is at the point of the shoulder, so it's really easy to think that shoulder pain is actually from the shoulder when it's from the C4 or C5 nerve root. Even T2 can be confused for, um, for nerve pain. So you're going to put the positive leads at the neck, negative leads distally, whatever kind of machine you're using, you just get the leads organized. And then we polarize the current positive. Now, the next group of slides are the trigger point diagrams for the neck and shoulder muscles. They're out of um, Travell and Simon's, the trigger point manual. Next slide, there we go. Next slide, there we go. Um, Travell and Simon's, the trigger point manual, and it's just to remind you of the anatomy and the neurology. So um, infraspinatus is C5, 6, levator is C3, 4, and 5, supraspinatus is C5, scalenes are C2 through C7. Darren, next slide. And then, next slide. Pec major is C5-6. Now, the pec minor can be confusing because it's right under the pec major, and it's C8-T1. So it gets its nerves from the next level down, and you'll have to move the contact from where the nerve starts to where the nerve ends if you want to treat the pec minor. The next slide, coracobrachialis is C6-7, biceps brachii, C5-6, the deltoid is C5-6, and that's just a reminder of um, the, the anatomy, where the muscles go and how they relate to each other. Next. So if you look at um, this next group, subscapularis is an internal rotator and adductor, and it's under the armpit. The infraspinatus is C5-6. The subscapularis is C5-6. The teres minor is in the back, just below the infraspinatus, and it's C5-6. And the teres major, which is an internal rotator, is also C5-6. And So those are the actors. Those are the muscles that you're going to feel and put your hands on. These muscles will be tight. They can be tender. The next slide will show the manual technique. Um, in the course seminar, somebody asked if I'm going to cover all this in the course seminar. Yeah, this is all included and a whole lot more. The course seminar is four days. So this is just a little taste of what you're going to hear in that. Um, one of the practitioners, I think in Philadelphia, said we should call this FSM, feel it, see it with your fingers and feel for it to melt. 
we use minimal pressure. You don't need to put a lot of motor in to relax the muscle um, because the frequencies are doing that. So if you have less motor going out, you have more sensory input going in and um, um, you can see with your fingers what the muscles are doing. You want to feel the anatomy, wait for the softening. And this will make more sense as we talk about what the um, uh, frequencies are going to be doing and the protocols we're going to be using. So the next frequency, so in general, next slide I mean, in general, when we're treating with FSM, we treat the nerve first because we can. The nerve is the easiest thing to treat. So for the first 10 years, so we've been doing this for 20 years, for the first 10 years, I treated the spinal cord, 40 on A, 10 on B is inflammation in the spinal cord. That softens the neck, mu neck muscles, and then I would reduce inflammation in the nerve, 40 and 396. That's pretty much for any muscle that gets its nerve from the spinal cord. But about six, seven, eight years ago, in a, in a core seminar, none of, is treating the cord and treating the nerve did not help the patient's upper trapezius to relax. The upper trapezius was like a rock. Well, the upper trapezius is innervated by the accessory nerve, and the accessory nerve comes from the medulla. Well, we have a frequency for the medulla. So this frequency that you see on this first line is to reduce the tone or reduce the input from the accessory nerve to the upper trapezius. So the only thing this frequency does, 40 and 94, is to relax the upper trapezius. In general, then you're going to treat the joint. And these numbers won't mean anything to you. The people that have taken the core seminar know what these mean. FSM is like learning a language. So I'm going to say what the tissues are, and you're going to have to either read the book or take the course to find out what the numbers mean and which tissue goes with which number, I guess. So inflammation in the immune system in general, 40 and 116. Inflammation in the cartilage, 157. Reducing inflammation in the periosteum or the lining of the bone. Reducing inflammation in the disc annulus, in the tendon, in the bursa. If you treat the nerve, treat the joint, um, that reduces the drive and the tone that goes to, um, that causes the muscles to be tight. Then you can treat hardening, 91, and scarring in between the nerve and the fascia. Right. Um, between the nerve and the fascia, the nerve and the joint capsule, 480, the nerve and the periosteum, 783, and then the nerve and the disc annulus. So we treat all of the underlying tissue. And then very last thing, you'll treat hardening and scarring in the nerve and between the nerve and the fascia. In the subscap, subscapularis, the reason the subscapularis is so tight and tender is those trigger points in the subscap are caused by adhesions between the nerve and the fascia in the subscapularis muscle, and you'll see a picture of that in a minute. Um, that trigger point responds to the frequency for scarring in the nerve, and the whole thing just lets go, and the subscap stops being tight. Um, so this is, this is what we do. You notice that the very last thing, the very last thing is treating the fascia and the muscle belly. So we treat the nerve, treat the joint, and then treat the muscle. So how does treating the cause relate to this? What you feel with your hands are tight muscles and trigger points. Yep, next slide, Darren. What you feel with your hands is tight muscles and trigger points. For most of us, what we think is the problem, and honestly, for the first eight or 10 years, what I thought was the problem was the muscle. I thought it was the muscle because that's what I feel with my hands. But eventually, when treating the muscle took forever, and when it was so much faster when I treated the facet joint, the disc, the cartilage, um, the nerves, 
that's when I found out it was the frequency response that taught what I learned about physiology, anatomy, neurology, pathology, immunology, every allergy that you could possibly know about for any particular condition, because this principle applies to everything you're going to treat. The nerves have neuroprotective mechanisms, and so the, the cerebellum will tighten the muscles, will, tighten, will increase drive to the nerves to tighten the muscles to protect the underlying joint pathology. And it's these neuroprotective mechanisms that regulate muscle tone. What we found out by treating with the frequencies for the underlying pathology is treating the muscle takes forever. Treating the muscle takes forever. But if you treat the underlying joint pathology and re remove why it is that the muscle is tight, the neuroprotective mechanisms and the nerve inflammation are what tighten the muscles. But why? What are the nerves trying to protect? If you don't have a way to treat that underlying pathology or the nerves, you'll never know. So what the frequency response teaches you, next, is that treating the nerve, the brain, and the cord will soften the muscles. Treating the underlying joint inflammation will soften the muscles and get rid of the trigger points. Treating adhesions between the nerve and the muscle will reduce pain and improve motion. The cerebellum is not going to let you move a muscle that is glued to a nerve. And um, I'm glad Dr. Simons isn't here to hear this line, but trigger points can't trigger points can and will disappear without ever using the frequencies for the muscles or fascia. Dr. Simons wanted muscles um, to be a muscle disease, wanted trigger points. He wanted trigger points to be a muscle disease so that the medical profession would accept it because the medical profession accepts diseases. Well, one of the things I found treating him actually was that I could treat his muscles and it didn't do anything. When I treated his low back discs and facet joints, we got rid of the trigger points in his quadratus lumborum and his psoas, and he'd been digging on those muscles for 10 years. So that was actually the first time I learned about that. That was when we got together in 2005, 2006. So this is, this is the beginning of how we found out to treat the cause. So when you look at the cervical spine and shoulder with the patient prone, if you have ever had your shoulder worked on, you know that the most tender muscle in your shoulder is the subscapularis, right? It's the one in your armpit. Um, they, it can be used quite effectively for probably torture. And when we treat the subscapularis, the, sh the neck and shoulder, we start by reducing the muscle tone in the accessory nerve to relax the upper trapezius so you can get at these underlying muscles, treat inflammation in the spinal cord to relax the neck muscles, treat inflammation in the nerve to relax the shoulder muscles, and then treat the subscapularis specifically. So inflammation in the subscapular nerve and you can see that in the, on the right, right where Darren's pointer is. That's a subscapular nerve. It comes from the C5-6 nerve root. Well, C5-6 disc is the most um, likely to degenerate. It's the first disc that gets injured. So when that disc gets injured, it irritates the nerve. When the nerve gets ir irritated, the subscapularis tightens up. And then with the subscapularis tight, the subscapular nerve gets glued to the fascia on the front of it. So to reduce the subscapular, ten, subscapular nerve and subscapularis tenderness, we reduce inflammation in the nerve, and then we need to relieve the adhesions between the nerve and the fascia. So in the axilla, we'll pin the tender spot right in the middle of the belly of the subscap, 
pin it and then gently move it about a centimeter or two, about every two and a half to three seconds. And eventually, in about two or three minutes, that muscle relaxes. If you come to the core seminar, any core seminar, that this is the first practicum that I demonstrate and it's the first practicum you do. Then when you treat the joint, you have the joint in the neck, inflammation in the cartilage, inflammation in the periosteum, and then inflammation in that C5-6 disc. So you treat those joints, the disc, the shoulder, the facet, sorry, the cartilage in the facet joint and the sh shoulder, the periosteum and the facet joint in the shoulder, and then the disc. Sometimes the tendon and the bursa um, is, are tender, and you have to reduce the inflammation in those. And then by the time we get through that third bullet point, we don't usually even have to treat the cervical muscles or the shoulder muscles. They're done. It's finished. There's nothing to do. They're all smushy. The 91 is the frequency for hardening and 142 is the frequency for fascia. And so just before we leave that practicum, I have people run the frequency to reduce hardening in the fascia and they can see that it does a little but it's not essential to the process of getting the hardening, to getting the fascia normal. And then we finish up by increasing secretions in the fascia. And what's interesting is when you increase secretions in the fascia, you theoretically increase ground substance, but that also makes the muscle soft, even softer. It's kind of interesting. So now I've got the treat the cause, uh, up front, and then I'll show you the practicum as we get ahead. But what you're going to find with your hands, so I'm going to do this in a little different order this time. What you're going to find with your hands are very widespread tight muscles and trigger points in the shoulder. They're like cat litter. They're everywhere. The teres has got little knots in it. The infraspinatus has got knots in it. The supraspinatus has got knots. The pecs have got knots. There's knots everywhere. Well, what we think is that it's the muscle because that's what we feel with our hands. But what we know is that the nerves and the neuroprotective me mechanisms, and neuroprotective mechanisms is what I'm using to describe what the cerebellum does to protect the underlying joint pathology. Okay? Neuroprotective, the cerebellum gets information from all all of the proprioceptors in that joint and everywhere, really. And if the cerebellum notices or is notified that there is an injury in the joint, the cerebellum increases the tone in the muscle that tightens up all the muscles to protect the joint. Yeah, we don't want you moving this joint. There's something wrong here. We're not sure what, but we're going to tighten everything up so you don't move it. And then because the muscles are chronically tight, you those muscles develop trigger points. So what the frequency response taught us, next slide, was that when treating the nerve, the brain, the cord, the joint inflammation, the adhesions between the nerve and the muscle, um, well, indeed, when that's the problem, that will reduce pain, soften the muscles, and improve motion. But this part in yellow, if there is a partial thickness rotator cuff tear, the cerebellum will tighten all the muscles to protect that injured tendon, and trigger points will form in all the muscles from the constant increased tone. And so we treat the nerve, treat the muscle, treat the joint, do all that stuff, and if there's a partial thickness tear, nothing happens. It just doesn't work. Muscles are still sore. It softens maybe 5%, 10%, but it's not magic. What's up with that? Took me until 19, no, it took me until 2008 to figure out, and it was because I treated somebody I knew, um, 
took me till then to figure out that the tone and the trigger points won't resolve until you treat the tendon or ligament injury. This patient had a rotator cuff surgery 10 years before. It fixed everything in his left shoulder. This was his right shoulder. And he said, I had the surgery two years ago on my right shoulder, and the trigger points won't resolve. This guy is a trigger point specialist. He's a physical therapist. And it's like, something's not right. So when I treated it, it's like, oh, I had in my head, oh, it's inflammation in the nerve. It's a 5-6 disc. It's adhesions between the nerve and the muscle. And it wasn't any of that. I said, what, what did they repair when they repaired your right shoulder, supraspinatus tendon? And when we palpated it, it turned, and they did it um, laparoscopically. And when we palpated the teres minor, or maybe the lower portion of the infraspinatus, you could feel a divot. He had a partial thickness tear in the teres of the infraspinatus that they missed because the supraspinatus tear was the one that they could see on MRI, and that's the one they went in laparoscopically to fix. The surgeon just missed the tear. So we treated the tendon for being torn or broken. And as you know, when you use the correct frequency, the patient gets pretty stoned. So um, he got really sleepy, and it took me about an hour. But all the trigger points in the, muscle, in the shoulder muscles were gone. All of his pain was gone. But not when I did the normal stuff. I treated the nerve. I treated adhesions in the nerve. I treated the muscles. Nothing worked. The only thing that worked was treating for torn and broken 124 in the tendon, 191, connective tissue, 100. And 100 is the ligaments, connective tissue, 77. So it says 10 to 20 minutes. Back then, I just treated it till it stopped softening, and it took about an hour. Now, this isn't effective for a complete tear. It's a partial thickness tear. He's a physical therapist. He had microcurrent available to him, so he went home and treated himself and did exercise and repaired the thing, and he's fine now. But I would never have known about this. I can't even imagine how many shoulder injuries I missed because I didn't know about this until whenever that was, 2010, 11. So then you still can treat the joint, the cartilage, the disc, the periosteum, the tendon, and the bursa, because when the muscles are all tight, you're going to irritate the tendons and the bursa, and you want to treat those for inflammation. Oh, there you go. I'm sitting here looking at the wrong slide. Okay, so yes, that's the slide we just talked about. So, um, so there are times, these are the experiences that taught me that you have to treat the cause, and that's the foundation of everything else we're going to do in the rest of this, uh, of this hour. Um, the next one. So the challenge you have with treating the cause, you have what you feel with your hands, tight muscles and trigger points, and we think it's the muscle because that's what we feel of our hands, right? But there's a problem with what we think we know. I thought I knew that it was the nerve, the disc, the facet, the cartilage, and the bursa that was causing the tight muscles. But I wasn't. It was torn tendon. And this is where we encounter what we think we know. So we have practitioners who think that everything, every problem, is due to toxicity. Oh, they just need to detox. That's why they're inflamed. They have toxicity. Okay, you have a frequency for toxicity. If you think everything is toxicity and you use those frequencies and it doesn't change, experience suggests that it's not toxicity. So if toxicity is the only thing you try, then using those frequencies won't help and you'll think it doesn't work. FSM is requires thought and a flexible mind. And another thing we run into is there are practitioners who have the idea that everything is emotional, that emotional issues or spiritual issues or whatever is the cause of just about everything. Well, they're always involved, but if you use the frequencies for emotions and you use the frequencies for um, 
brain trauma or whatever, and that isn't what it is, then using those frequencies will not help. So what's exciting is that the frequency response can teach you. It will teach you. It took me, I don't know, five years and 50,000 patient visits before I figured out that the frequency response can be believed, that it's always correct, even when it doesn't make sense. So I'm just throwing that out there. So then on the next slide, we'll talk about treating the shoulder supine. So you treat the patient with the shoulder prone, you know, treat the patient's neck and shoulder with them laying on their stomach. And you sit them up and you look at their range of motion in the shoulder and it's still not quite normal. They can get to 160 or 70 degrees, but the very top of the arc, past about 130 or 40, this says 120, but it's actually probably 130 or 40, it slows down and the shoulder biomechanics become not normal, not smooth, it's sticky. So this restriction suggests, after mileage and mileage and mileage, suggests that there are possible adhesions between the latissimus and the serratus, and between the lats and even the subscap up in the corner. I'm hoping I have a picture. Well, there's a picture. The next page shows the, the patients with their skin on it. It doesn't show the anatomy. But you know that the latissimus comes from the low back and attaches on the inside part of the upper arm. The serratus lines the chest wall and running in between the serratus and the lats, you have the long thoracic nerve. Well, is the cerebellum going to let you lengthen the latissimus? Because that's the only way you're going to get that arm up in the air over your head. Is it going to let the latissimus glide along the serratus if the long thoracic nerve is glued there? Uh, no. That's just, no, it's really not negotiable. The cerebellum is an absolute, I would say, absolute subversive or, um, yeah, dictator. Because it does what it does, and it doesn't tell you that that's what it did. The patient thinks that this range of motion is impaired, because they have impingement. That's what the doctor told them. They injected steroids up there, didn't help, but it's, it's impingement because the pain is up at the top and you can't raise it all the way up. Cerebellum didn't tell you that what it's doing is keeping the latissimus short because the latissimus is glued to the long thoracic nerve, which is glued to the serratus. Doesn't tell you that. But because you know what you know about the anatomy, you can treat inflammation in the nerve, reduce the tenderness so that you can get your hands in and between the layers of muscle, and then treat scarring in the nerve, 13 and 396, and that will increase the range. And you just literally peel apart the subscapularis, the latissimus, and the serratus. Those of you that are myofascial therapists, massage therapists, physical therapists, or chiropractors, you know how long this takes. Just the last slide, the one treating, or the first slide, the one treating the shoulder prone, that's two months worth of work, and you'll do it in 45 minutes or 60 minutes. It's easy. This is another 30 to 60 minutes, and in the real world, world it's another in the manual world, it's another month's worth of work if you can do it. So we use minimal pressure, doesn't hurt. You press and you wait for it to melt and then you mobilize the tissue into abduction and you just free up the shoulder. This is like the secret weapon. So this is these slides are from the practicum portions of the core seminar. So I'm hoping I'm not losing too many people. The supine cervical practicum is for those people that have that tight spot and pain at the 
base of their skull. So they have pain in the back of their neck. They have tight muscles up at the upper cervical spine. So we put a washcloth behind the head um, from the neck up to the occipital ridge, put the positive leads there, and then a warm wet washcloth on the chest just below the clavicle. And between those two contacts, you're going to have current so that you can treat all of the muscles in between the two contacts and all of the nerves that go to all of those muscles. So next slide is going to show the muscles that you're treating, the scalenes and the longus coli. If you treat the scalenes and the longus coli manually, it's um, a little bit tricky, right? They're very fragile. Well, the muscles aren't fragile, but there's vascular structures, um, carotid arteries, um, baroreceptors, the vagus nerve. Um, it's not a place where you want to go mashing with any sort of enthusiasm or force. So that's the trigger point pattern and the referral pattern. Next slide. So in this practicum, more than almost any, this is the place where you learn to put your brain at the end of your fingers, put your eyes at the end of your fingers, and listen with your fingertips. These slides are directly from the core seminar practicum. Um, <coughs> and you can feel the tissue inside the neck um, with your fingertips. So next slide. Look at the tissue. So we think about anatomy as tissue types. So on that, that anatomy slide on the right, that 480, that's the joint capsule. That is between the lamina <coughs> at two, three, four. That's the C4, 5 facet. Hang on, I'm going to cough. Excuse me. So that's the joint capsule. There's a nerve that lays right across the joint capsule. There are nerves that run all through the area. <laughs> so when you treat, we have to see the anatomy as tissue types, but you also have to think about the neuroprotective mechanisms. What is the cerebellum trying to protect? What is the cerebellum trying to protect? That's your question when you're treating the muscles. So this is just the, the guidance that we give during the practicum, the next slide, um, about how to move your hands and one hand at a time, and that makes this portion of the manual um, practicum safe because you're only treating one side. You keep one hand moving, one hand still, so that you're never going to be on both carotids or both vertebral arteries or both jugulars or both vagus nerves. And then the next one, we need to treat the cause. So what do you feel with your hands? If you reach up right now and feel your neck with your hands, if you're looking at a computer and watching this webinar, you're going to feed, feel tight muscles at the base of your skull, right? And in the back of your neck because for most of us, we're not sitting up the way we should, and your head is sort of hanging out forward, and your muscles are gonna tighten up to support your neck. So we think the problem is the muscle, because that's what we feel with our hands. But neuroprotective mechanisms, that pesky cerebellum, will protect the underlying joint pathology from the facet joints, and the cartilage, and the disc, and the nerves, adhesions in the nerves, and that regulates muscle tone. If you don't have a way to treat the underlying pathology or the nerves, you'll never know that. So this is what the frequencies have taught us so much about how the body really works. It's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> so. Let's see if I have proper pictures. Okay. So what the frequency response has taught us, and there are pictures that go through all this, but these are things I never would have thought of, certainly didn't think of them 15, 20 years ago when I started treating myofascial pain, treating necks. Adhesions between the dura and the rectus capitis posterior minor increase tone 
and trigger points in the RCP minor. Even minor, mild upper cervical ligament laxity will increase tone and trigger points in the RCP major and the obliques. Aaron, if you'll flip to the next slide, you'll be able to see a picture of what I'm talking about. So those are those muscles. The RCP minor is the one in the middle uh, next to the little red circle that goes up and down, the RCP major, and then the obliques are those three that are in the circle. But go back to the, the last slide. Treating the brain, the cord, and the nerves will soften the muscles. And then you'll be able to find out that the upper cervical muscles are usually tight due to facet joint pathology. In virtually everybody, the upper cervical muscles are tight because the cartilage, the joint capsule, and the periosteum in the underlying facet joint is inflamed. Why is it inflamed? Because we have crummy posture. And if you've ever been rear-ended, if you've ever fallen off a bicycle, fallen off a horse, uh, played tennis, played golf, um, sat at a computer for eight hours at a time, you get the picture, that f upper facet joint, those posterior joints, the cartilage gets traumatized and inflamed. And what is the cerebellum's response? Well, I can't fix the cartilage, but I can keep her from moving the joint. I can do that. So the cerebellum tightens up the muscles that are overlying on top of, between the facet joint and the skin, and you feel the tight muscles. Are the tight muscles the problem? No. The tight muscles are the response of the cerebellum to the inflammation in the cartilage, the bone, and the periosteum, and the joint capsule. That's like saying, don't shoot the messenger, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's like when the oil light comes on on, on your car because you're low on oil. Instead of changing the oil, you put a Band-Aid over the light. How's that working for you? The lower cervical muscles are almost always tight, unless somebody's had a lot of posterior trauma where their head has been whipped back into extension a lot. Usually, the lower cervical muscles are tight due to disc pathology. So if you feel down the front of your neck, next to your Adam's apple, in front of the SCM, tuck your chin a little bit, Gently, on one side only, poke your fingers in there. Those muscles shouldn't be sore. And most of us will have a sore muscle right about C5-6, right next to your Adam's apple, right in the front. It's a teeny disc bulge. Does that mean you have to have spine surgery? No, it means you have a teeny disc bulge. And the cerebellum has decided that the scalenes and the longus coli should be tightened to stabilize that joint. The cerebellum has its own immutable logic. What we found using the frequencies, if you treat the cause, the trigger points disappear without ever using the frequencies for the muscles of the fascia. You don't have to treat the muscles. You treat the underlying pathology, you get the cerebellum to just chill out by fixing what it's worried about, and things get better. So. 124 is the frequency for torn and broken, and 100 is the ligaments. So often the dura and the suboccipitals, and those initials are the obliquus capitis superior, obliquus capitis inferior. So the superior is that little diagonal muscle on the outside on the, on the right. Um, um, and then the obliquus capitis inferior is that long one that runs from the um, what do you call that, the transverse process of C1 down to the spinous process of C2, and then the RCP major that runs from the occiput down to the spinous process of C2. So if the suboccipitals relax when you run torn and broken in the ligaments, and literally, virtually 100% of the time, all of us have had enough trauma that those ligaments have an opinion about your injuries. And you treat torn and broken in the ligaments, and those, those particular muscles, those three, will just go smushy. Those of you that do massage know that getting these muscles, in particular, turned to jello, 
takes about an hour. And with FSM, it's about five minutes. It's amazing. And the only thing that did it was torn and broken in the ligaments. Now, it took me 16 years to figure this out. But now that it's there, it makes this whole treat the neck process. It's, <laughs> Terry Renfro said, smush is a technical term. That's exactly what they do. They turn to pudding. Um, there's no word for smush in German. So when you do this course in Germany, uh, we, they translate smush to pudding. Then people get it. So then the next slide is once you get those lateral muscles to relax. Hi, Terry. Once you get those lateral muscles to relax, then you move your fingers medial, and now the patient is laying on their back, and your fingers are sort of straight up in the middle. And look at the anatomy. Look at the anatomy, that, slide, that part in the middle. This is the RCP minor, the little red thing, and then that little pink line inside the skull is the dura. Right? That's the dura. It lines your skull, it lines your spinal cord, goes all the way down to your tailbone. Then, see that little yellow connected tissue right there between the dura and the RCP minor? That is a connected tissue bridge that attaches the dura to the RCP minor. So you think about an auto accident where you've whipped your head back, and this bone right here, uh, if you can find it with your pointer, Darren, this bone right here just just above that orange thing, right there, yeah, that bone, that's your skull. Your skull whips back, that's C1. Your skull is going to whack into C1 and bruise this connective tissue, and all it has to do is bleed a teeny bit, just a drop. Every drop of blood has fibrocytes in it. So the dura is now scarred down to the RCP minor. Sarah Bellin going to let you move the RCP minor? Not. Absolutely will not. So we worked on the RCP minor as a muscle, hardening, scarring in the muscle. Didn't do anything. It wasn't until, I think it was Tom Myers, showed me this picture. It's like, oh my God, it's the Dura. We started treating scar tissue in the dura, and the RCP minor just turns to pudding. It takes a little bit because you have to kind of peel it off, and it takes maybe more than one session. But, I mean, session being five to six minutes, <clears throat> and you treat it a little bit more. So those are those two pieces of this supine cervical practicum. So then if you go to the next slide, the supine cervical practicum is where you absolutely learn to treat the cause, is the upper trapezius will only melt when you run the frequencies to quiet the activity in the medulla, which is where the accessory nerve comes from. That's the only thing that frequency does. Well, in this case, when you're treating muscles, it makes the upper trap go smush. And once the upper trap is out of the way, you can actually feel what's under it, even in weightlifters, bodybuilders, football players. Once it softens, they'll still have the tone they have from being so strong, but it's not super tight. You can get under it. Then you run torn and broken in the ligaments, and the lateral suboccipitals melt. Then you run scarring in the dura and peel that RCP minor off the middle, off the dura in the center. Then the upper cervical muscles will relax when you treat the facet joints. Do you treat the upper cervical muscles? Honestly, no. Why? Because it doesn't work. I'm a pragmatist. I, I like to fix stuff. So you get the upper cervical muscles to relax and stay relaxed by reducing inflammation, 40, in the cartilage, 157, the joint capsule, 480, and 783, the periosteum. And once those cervical muscles get all squishy, like literally, they, I don't know, they turn to pudding. You just, and, but in a good way. Not bad pudding, good pudding. So underneath then those muscles, then you'll be able to feel the ridge of the joint capsule. What's wrong with the joint capsule? It's hard. Okay, you have a frequency for hardening. That's 91. 
What's the tissue? What are your fingers on? It's the joint capsule. What's wrong with it? It's hard. So you soften the joint capsule. And then as the joint capsule gets all smushy, then you go down to scarring, which you're going to find in the middle of that squishy joint capsule now, that soft joint capsule. There'll be a tender spot right in the middle of it that just sort of connected to the patient's upper lip. Ah! That tender spot, over time we have learned, <clears throat> is caused by the nerve, the medial branch of the posterior root where it lays across that joint capsule. It's glued to the joint capsule because of the chronic inflammation and the hardening. So is the cerebellum going to let you move the muscles as long as the nerve is glued to the joint capsule? No. How do you get the cerebellum to let the muscles relax on a permanent basis? Well, you have to treat the adhesions in the nerve between the nerve and the capsule. So you do that and you gently move the muscles and sort of peel those nerves off the posterior capsules. You check for residual tight muscles and usually what you'll find next is the lower circles and those are virtually 100% of the time from the discs. Inflammation in the, um, inflammation in the disc annulus is 710. And then you retreat specific areas as needed. So now we're now you can go to the next one. So where do you put your hands for the facet joints and the suboccipitals? Well, we put backs of the hands on the table, lift the fingertips up towards the ceiling, and then you wait for it to soften from the use of the frequency. Um, this is just an example of of what's in the practicum instruction. So there are. <laughs> cardiologists, internists, acupuncturists, people that don't do body work have no idea where to find the RCP minor. So um, it's located one centimeter lateral to midline in the space between the occiput and C1. So that's just where you put the hands. Hands for the discs, there's instructions about that. So when we're treating people, it's really important that the your hands, that you and the patient are safe. So Darren, if you can go to the next one, that hands for the discs are more common in the low cervical spine, and you're going to glide over the anterior muscles and then the posterior muscles one side at a time. And when you're treating inflammation in the disc, you'll find that these anterior muscles relax. So here's the next slide is the summary. Treat the nerve. 40 and 94 is the accessory nerve to relax the upper trapezius. Spinal cord, um, 10, that relaxes the deep cervical muscles. And then the muscles that are innervated by the um, uh, dermatomes, the posterior roots. Treat the ligaments, release the dura, treat the upper facet joints, the joint capsule, um, treat the discs, and then at the very end, honestly, about 80% of the time, you don't need to touch the muscles unless you've had surgery or some sort of real trauma to the neck. You treat the muscle for scarring between the fascia and the nerve and hardening in the fascia. So that's how do you treat the C-spine supine. So uh, this next two slides may be a little advanced, but for those of you that have taken FSM already, when we treat the nerve, the brain, the cord, the underlying joint inflammation, the adhesions between the nerve and the muscle, normally it reduces the pain, softens the muscles, and improves motion. So the patient is very happy and everything works. However, if the patient has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a genetic condition where the connective tissue is really lax, it's kind of creepy. They can take their thumb and fold it back and lay it up against their forearm. It's like, ew. And their fingers are bent up all the way, like 120 degrees. It's, it, it's, it has, it's a very complicated condition, and it leads to a lot of joint and disc injuries. But if the, so if the patient has Ehlers-Danlos, the cerebellum is going to protect, is going to tighten the muscles to protect the lax connective tissue. 
right? The ligaments are lax, the connective tissue and the tendons are lax, and so the cerebellum tightens the muscles. These patients have constant pain around the joints because the muscles are tight to protect the ligaments, the tendons, and the connective tissue. They have trigger points because of the constant tone, um, because of the constant increased tone from the cerebellum tightening up the muscles, right, to protect the joint. The tone and the trigger points won't resolve until you treat the cause, which is the connective tissue laxity. You have to treat the cause. So the treatment protocol for Ehlers-Danlos is completely different, completely different. Treat the, the, the patients will know they have ligamentous laxity. The patients will know they have Ehlers-Danlos. They will know it when they get to you. They know it when they're 12, 13. <clears throat> Some of them are just, think they're just flexible, but usually by the time they end up with a lot of joint pain and muscle pain, somebody makes the diagnosis. So the first thing you do with an Ehlers-Danlos patient is treat torn and broken in the ligaments, 124 and 100, torn and broken in the connective tissue. Next slide, Darren. There we go. Torn and broken in the dura. So I had an Ehlers-Danlos patient at a seminar, and I treated the ligaments and the connective tissue, and his neck muscles still stayed tight and tender. And it's like, what is going on with that? What am I missing? What am I missing? And then I thought, well, the dura is a kind of specialized connective tissue. So I treated torn and broken in the dura, and all of his neck muscles relaxed, and all of his neck pain went away. Then we treated the nerve. That softened the muscle. But then once the muscles are soft, the ligaments and connective tissue are at risk again. So torn and broken in the ligaments, the connective tissue, the tendons, and the dura. You repeat that because now the muscles are soft and the joint motion is greater. I hope this is making sense to you. The trick with FSM is not memorizing frequencies. The frequencies don't matter that much. You can look those up. It's a concept. If you have lax ligaments, what is the cerebellum going to do? It will tighten the muscles. So you treat the cause. Treat the lax ligaments, the connective tissue, the lax dura. Then treat the nerve to quiet things down. Then treat the ligaments and the connective tissue again. Cause. When the ligaments and connective tissue are irritated, or, or lax, sorry, when the ligaments and connective tissue are lax, what takes the hit? What gets traumatized? Well, a joint. Okay, what's inside the joint? The cartilage, 157, the joint capsule, the periosteum, and the disc annulus. Um, and then sometimes you'll get adhesions between the nerve and the fascia. So treating those causes will soften the muscle. Once you soften the muscle, you have to go back and treat the ligaments, connective tissue, tendon, and dura again. And then you can use the frequency to increase secretions in the fascia, and that will lay down ground substance, okay, to help repair it. You're not going to fix this. This is a genetic condition. The patient doesn't have the genes for making proper connective tissue. So you're going to have to treat them every two to three days. This is a good place to use a home unit of whatever brand you use. We use the custom cares, obviously. But you can use anything you want. Or the patient can just come see you once a week. But at least they're out of pain. So treat the cause. Um, oh, here's a, this one is really fun. What the frequency response teaches you, we wouldn't know this without the frequency response. So the muscles are quiet. There's no increased tone. You can't find any trigger points. The range of motion passively is perfect, but the patient is afraid to move the arm, move the shoulder full range, or complains of vague, nonspecific. They're nervous about it. Why? I mean, think about it. You've been in pain for seven years. Somebody just fixes you in, you know, 50 minutes. Now what? You have to treat the cause. Why are they afraid 
to move the shoulder. Next slide. That is something in medicine called central sensitization. So the midbrain, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, they remember their job is to remember that it hurts to protect. Don't do that again. That's what the midbrain does. Thalamus, the amygdala, the hippocampus. The amygdala has the emotional part of the pain. Ow, that's bothersome. The hippocampus remembers, and the thalamus sensitizes to the pain. So once the thalamus is used to being in pain, you get rid of the pain from the shoulder, but the patient still behaves as if they are in pain. So I think Darren called this mild PTSD. I feel as if I should be in pain, but I'm not. That's what the more articulate patients can say. But if somebody is nervous about, or they just get a funny look on their face, that's the midbrain. You quiet the activity of with 40, and you just let that run until the look on their face changes. The thalamus resets the pain threshold and changes function from pain suppression to pain amplification. And so it's incongruent. It doesn't fit when the body pain peripherally goes down. So you treat to quiet the thalamus, 40 and 89, and it takes about 10 minutes. You have to repeat it the next time they see you, but it's 10 to 15 minutes, and then the look on their face changes. And then when they go to move it, it's like it's not coordinated. So we have the ability to increase secretions in the cerebellum. Now you can do this if you don't, if you're not an FSM practitioner, you can do this if you're good at hypnosis or patients good at visualization. You can visualize little lights or little dots going from the cerebellum down to the shoulder as you move it, or you can run increased secretions in the cerebellum and actually drive the connection between the cerebellum and the shoulder. And then once the cerebellum can coordinate the movement, then the patient still has to find it up in their head. This thing has been in pain for so long, it doesn't exist in your motor cortex anymore, it exists in your thalamus, because it's just pain. It's not actually you know, a functioning shoulder. So increase secretions in the cerebellum to get it to move, and then increase secretions in the sensory cortex to connect it from the sensory cortex out to the limb. That's sort of, it's not from the advanced, we actually do this in the core, but it's easier if you're gonna to come to a court sometime in the future to just get the concept in your head that this is possible. Now you can do it with um, visualization. Now there's a central pain precaution. There's actually some guy that, um, a medical doctor that went around to all the pain meetings about 10, 12 years ago and told people in the audience with a perfectly straight face that there is no such thing as peripheral pain generators, that all pain is central pain. So when we run, reduce inflammation or reduce the activity of the midbrain, um, the, the problem is that the normal function of the thalamus is to suppress pain. If the patient is not actually sensitized or amplified and you quiet the ability of the midbrain to suppress the pain, the pain's gonna go up. So this is how we learned this, was by doing it. One of the practitioners called me, told me the story of going to the seminar, told me he just, like literally, patients in the room, I just ran 40 and 89 and the patient's pain went up and this doctor who spoke from the podium said it would go down. He's like, mm, no. So you can reverse it. But Carolyn, so, uh -huh. um, just a time check here. We, 15 minutes will be at 7.30 or 5.30, which is when we probably should end this. It'll be an hour and a half. Oh, okay. You're only about halfway through the slides that you have, so you might want to think of prioritizing mm. what you want to cover. Yeah, I should have left that last one out. It's a tough concept. Yeah. Um, okay. This is the next one, lumbar, dura, coccyx, hips, and neck. So if you look at this long, skinny body, 
the dura attaches to the coccyx, goes all the way up the spinal cord to the neck at the base of the skull and the brain. So you treat somebody that's got really restricted hip flexion, right? And the, you go to flex the hips. We think of the hips as being tight. We say the psoas is tight. Well, we have a, 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 an ability to treat scarring in the dura. And that completely releases the coccyx and the sacrum and allows that motion to continue. Um, let's see, lumbar spine supine. All right, so Darren, go down to slide 48. So this is why we treat it. That's just a little anatomy. Um, rectus abdominis and the psoas. Okay, so here it is. 48 is back, that's 51, this is 48. Oh, that's right, we had your slides at the front. So this one, treat the cause. So treat the cause, next, next one down. There we go. So the frequency response when we treat the lumbar spine, if the pain is worse when the patient leans back, walks, or sits, you have to treat the facet joints to reduce the pain, the muscle toim, and the trigger points. If the patient is worse, if the pain is worse when the patient leans forward, you have to treat the discs. So that's just normal mechanics. If the problem started with a strictly a muscle injury, then you have to treat the muscle for trauma and torn and broken and right, you treat the muscle. But so when we treat, so the next one, the musculoskeletal treatment, we treat the nerve, treat the facet joint or the disc. You have to treat what's causing the muscles to be tight. All right. And you can still treat the muscle. But if the pain, next slide, if the pain doesn't respond to muscle facet or disc, then it probably isn't the muscle. So the answer is in the history. Where does it hurt? When does it hurt? What makes it worse? That's the W's. Where, when, and what? What makes it worse? If the pain is worse after, nope, back it up. If the pain is worse after meals, check the gallbladder and the intestines. If the patient drinks a lot of alcohol or is exposed to chemicals, check the liver. Depending on where exactly the muscles are tight, check and treat the underlying area of the viscera, the intestine, the ureter, the kidney, or the ovary. And this next slide is something we do in the core seminar, and it's, uh, we don't have time to go that now. But it gives you an idea about treating the cause. So there's going to be trigger points in the midline rectus, if you go about four bullet points down, there's going to be trigger points in the midline rectus if the patient has eaten something they're allergic to. So usually it's a small intestine and we're treating it for inflammation and allergy reaction. What are we doing with those frequencies? We're getting rid, rid of trigger points in the midline rectus. Do I have any ev evidence that says I'm reducing inflammation and histamine response in the small bowel? No. What are those frequencies for? They're to treat trigger points in the midline rectus abdominis. The ureter um, gets adhered to the front of the psoas, so this very tender psoas will respond to the frequencies to remove scarring between the ureter, the bladder, the kidney, and the fascia in front of the psoas. So that's that gives you an idea of how we address treat the cause. And the frequency, next one, the frequency response teaches you if nothing else works, listen to the patient carefully. Listen to the history and when possible, keep going until you figure it out. You have to treat the cause. Sometimes it really is emotions. Sometimes what the patient didn't tell you in the history was that they got raped when they were 30. They didn't tell you that. But when only the emotional frequencies work for, the, for terror, pretty good clue, right? Next. All right. So there is a frequency that we use to remove the fact of trauma. And this one is just fun. The fact of trauma. So it, it's if you have an injury, like you run into the ordrium with your shoulder, you have the pain, ow, but you also have the trauma itself, the shock of it, okay? That's a pattern that gets impressed on this semiconductor matrix. So this is a patient. Oh, my. Well, I've got the history wrong. 
I've got the slides in the wrong order. So drop down to where it says first set. Next. The first child, her first child was in neonatal intensive care. She was premature. The patient was pregnant with her second child before the first child was out of the hospital. She said, as I was treating her pelvic floor muscles, trying to get rid of the trigger points, she hadn't had intercourse in a year and a half. And she said, I thought it was just the pelvic floor muscles. And she kept saying, she said two or three times, my uterus never had time to recover, right? Recover from what? My uterus never had time to recover. So if you go to the next slide, recover from what? I treated the pelvic floor muscles, didn't do any good. What is the cerebellum trying to protect? Recover from trauma to the uterus? That was worth a try. And I used the frequency to remove trauma from the uterus and the pelvic floor muscles went completely smushy in about 20 minutes. I didn't have to treat the muscle at all. Treating the muscle didn't do anything. Why? Because the problem wasn't the muscle. The problem was the cerebellum wanting to protect the uterus, right? It was fascinating. So when I treated, next one, trauma in the uterus, this woman hadn't had intercourse in a year and a half. She wanted a third child. Completely relaxed the pelvic floor muscles, intercourse was pain-free, and her third child is two years old. We've got 10 slides and seven minutes. We can do that. So treating TMJ, if you look at the anatomy, you've got the muscle belly, the disc, the cartilage, 157, 783 is the periosteum. Treat the nerve, treat the muscle, treat the joint, treat the disc. And what I found was it was difficult, took repeated treatments, didn't work very well. It was not very satisfying. However, when I treated the cause, I found that in the history, the patient has a tendon injury or ligamentous laxity. The cerebellum is going to tighten, next slide, is going to tighten all the muscles to protect this lax or injured connective tissue. And then the trigger points in all the TMJ muscles form to increase from the increased tone. So if you think about the TMJ patients, the TMJ started after trauma, I got hit in the jaw, I had an auto accident, I fell, hit my jaw, had braces, had wisdom tooth surgery where they, trauma, where they hold the mouth open really wide and you, and you strain that tendon. Even the capsule dislocating, the disc dislocating out of the joint, that's because that disc is connected to the pterygoids. So the tone and the trigger points don't resolve until you treat the connective tissue laxity. You have to treat the cause. When you do that, what's the problem? Is the pterygoid the problem? Is the disc the problem? Is the muscle belly the problem? Not really. What's the problem? This tendon injury that I got when they held my mouth open for an hour and a half to get rid of my wisdom teeth, it's the ligamentous injury in the tooth ligaments when we had my braces on. It's connective tissue injury from the tight muscles. When you treat torn and broken in the tendon, the ligament, the connective tissue, things get better. And then the last case is important because the asthma protocol has just been really, really effective in cases of acute and chronic asthma. So you have to use it safely and make sure the patient is safe. Um, but what the, freak next, what the frequency response teaches you is to check the history. Treating asthma that started when the patient had an infection or treating asthma that has been worse since an infection or treating asthma that has a productive and really gurgly cough, treat the infection first. You have to treat the cause. So when we treat asthma, you can treat allergy reaction and spasm in the bronchi. You can treat toxicity, but we treat infection first. And this wasn't as big a priority 10 years ago. So for those, those practitioners that, are, that have taken the course before, this is, this is new information in the last two years. Um, so 
and then to increase the, the chest volume you have to treat, why is the chest volume impaired? It's because the bronchi get tight and stiff. Well, they're, they're scarred, they're fibrosed. So you treat to remove the tightness and remove the scarring from the bronchi and the chest volume will increase. So easy to walk on water once you know where the rocks are. Um, the last slides are about the resonance effect. Um, I actually have that easy to walk on water carved into a rock on my front porch. The garden store did it, it was really fun. So the resonance effect, if you haven't read it yet, it's turned out to be a real page turner. People really enjoy it. Um, the core seminar refresher, if you've taken the core seminar before, it changes every time. And um, especially in the last three to five years, it's quite different than it was before that. If you haven't ever taken a core seminar, you can come to Phoenix, Portland, Berlin, Philadelphia, Denver, Atlanta, Tuscany, Bad Nauheim in Germany, Chester, Taipei, Chicago, and San Francisco. What was that little dingly thing? Was that you? So that's the end, the next one. And then this is the... Oh, webinar. Yes. yes. And so, yes, you actually got through it by... I did. By 5.30, amazing. A 5.28. <laughs> so, so there's something you said earlier, Carol. This is Darren again. Mm -hmm. that this thing about how there's all these different causatives. You've been talking about all the different causes. Mm -hmm. and so some of them, there's all these structural causes and these neurological causes and emotional causes and trauma causes and infection causes. So in this next webinar that Carolyn's going to host me for her group on February 7th, I'm going to take it to another level of cause that was not discussed today because we all have our different perspectives how you look at things in a multi-dimensional matter where everything we discussed today would be in certain of those dimensions. There's other dimensions that you can actually address clinically that I'll be going over on that one February 7th. So another way to rock your world then, also free of charge. <laughs> and everybody who's registered for this webinar, I'm gonna send an email out so you'll have all the links for this recording once it's completed, and then also everything, Carolyn, for her seminars, and then for this one, to make it all easy to access the stuff. Thank you so much, Darren. This was fun. I hope it wasn't too much to cover, but it was really a blast. Um, well, we had a little rocky start there with the technology. Yes. Um, but thank you so much for your generosity and taking your great hard word, you know, hard created stuff and sharing it with us. This is just beautiful. It only matters when everybody can do it. The fact that it's reproducible is what's the most important thing, that everybody can learn how to do it and that it will help their patients and their practices and their lives. Um, that's what we're here for. Well, I love the fact that you keep talking about how you stumbled around and through trial and error and all these like thousands of cases, you discovered a lot of these things. That's mm -hmm. really awesome, the way you discover it through pragmatic cases and through a lot of your students and so on. So this is such a valuable body of knowledge. Yeah. Well, and if I can, if we can shorten the learning curve by teaching people where to look for the breadcrumbs, so that's, that makes it um, really Im important and worthwhile for the practitioners because there's no reason to stumble around. I've been doing it for 20 years. And if I can shorten the learning curve, yeah. then it, it makes more people easier to help. Um, there's tons and tons of questions, but I guess you, you want to answer any of them or do you, how much time do you have? I have, I have time. I'm at home. This is, this day is yours. Okay. Well, what else, um, I have limited time, but let's take 15 minutes. How about that? See okay. how many questions you get through in 15 minutes. So sure. we'll, we'll, we'll carry on a little longer for those who can stay. And again, this is being recorded. So I'm going to go to the, let's see, there is the ones under the Q and a, uh, Kevin Barr wrote, um, Phyllis Berger in her book, The Journey to Pain Relief, instructs to use TENS with the negative electrode to be placed on the site of pain, positive is placed above, below, or to the side. Is this in contradiction to yours? No, TENS works by a completely different mechanism. It's the TENS provides a lot of uh, muscle contraction and sensory input, and TENS just blocks the ascending pain pathways by flooding them with more sensation that inter interferes with pain. I'm not familiar with their book, but this is a completely different mechanism, and TENS is not therapeutic. It's palliative. You might as well take Advil. Yeah. 
And then Tina's asking, um, how do you determine whether to stay on a frequency? What's interesting is once you, if you can get yourself to relax your hands and feel it, within, when you're brand new, probably 15 to 20 seconds, you can feel the muscles start to soften. It's like you left a balloon on the living room floor overnight and you come in in the morning and you know how it's just a little bit squishy? All right. That's what the muscle feels like, and it happens when the frequency is correct. It'll happen within 15 to 20 seconds. When you're brand new, maybe take you 30 seconds. So if the muscle doesn't soften, the frequency isn't working. Um, and if it does soften, it's working, and you stay on it until it stops going smush. Yeah. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, most of the comments in the chat are all people saying, thank you, I loved it, great, I'm grateful. So all that kind of stuff. Um, Yay. Yeah, so here's what no, Terry has said. There was one question about infection and joints. Okay. Uh-oh. Kevin, did you lose? I'm still looking at the questions here in the chat. Um, yes. Summer asked how to treat piriformis syndrome might be a result of polio as a child. Well, there's a frequency, it's interesting, post-polio syndrome, um, there's a frequency for polio that we give in the advanced. And uh, piriformis syndrome from post-polio is not that common in the ones that I've treated. It's more long track. So you have... Um, muscle weakness in the lower extremity, a little bit of foot drop, a little bit of biomechanical oddness from the post-polio syndrome. Sometimes you'll have really tight adductors and hamstrings and quadriceps because you've lost descending inhibition. And the piriformis shows up. It's what you think is wrong. Um, oh, hi, David Mesnick. So the piriformis shows up because it's what you think is wrong because the patient has a pain in their butt. But why is the piriformis tight? It doesn't get tight for no reason. The piriformis is going to be tight because the adductors are tight. And the adductors are tight because you've lost descending inhibition in the spinal cord. You have to think of polio as affecting the cord and the nerves. It doesn't, it's not in the muscles. So you treat to increase descending inhibition in the spinal cord, that loosens the adductors, that lets the piriformis relax. And sometimes if the piriformis is really tight, it'll compress the sciatic nerve, which sometimes runs through it or under it. And then the nerve gets cranky. You think it's the piriformis, but you have to check, especially in post polio, you have to check the rest of the leg. I'm, I'm gonna mm, be skeptical about post-polio syndrome causing piriformis syndrome. It's, it's a, it's, we'll cover it. It's in the core. Okay. <laughs> and then Robert asked, do you primarily use bare hands for your soft tissue work these days or do you still use graphite gloves? Which do you prefer? No, I, we haven't used the graphite gloves in our hands in almost 10 years. It's crazy. So the graphite gloves I used in the beginning because I don't know why, it just seemed like a good idea. So what we found was if you, they get in the way. You have to keep taking your hand off the patient. So everything you saw on those slides was alligator clips hooked to either warm, wet wraps with Velcro or wet towels. The photographs for the book are all with wet towels. And then you use your bare hands in between the towels, and that way you can change the frequencies, you can move your hands, you can follow the follow the breadcrumbs, um, you have a lot more flexibility. I never wear the gloves on my hands. As a matter of fact, we don't even sell them. We don't, we don't include them with the devices anymore. We use alligator clips, so you can attach alligator clips to whatever you want. Yeah, I'm no longer the black glove lady. <laughs> <laughs> You're not black ops either, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Treat black ops. But. Um, and then David Musnick asked about peripheral sensitization versus central sensitization. And peripheral sensitization is like nerve hyperesthesia, and that responds to 40 and 396. This business about, there's two parts to pain. One is 
how much it actually hurts. The other is how much you mind it, how much it bothers you. If the patient is centrally sensitized, it's bothersome. Now, nerve pain is always bothersome. Anytime it's nerve pain, there will almost always be central sensitization. You just, you can't avoid it because you go nerve, spinal cord, brain. There's, it's one big track and they're all connected. So anytime it's nerve pain, it's always spinal cord and, and brain sensitization. But central sensitization is when the peripheral tissue doesn't hurt, but the patient is either afraid to move it or feels as if it should be in pain, but because you ask them, what's your pain level? Uh, one, okay, but it still hurts. That doesn't make any sense. You don't tell the patient it doesn't make sense, but you run 40 and 89 and wait three or four minutes and say, okay, how's that feel? Oh, that's better. Okay. So 40 and 89 will tell you whether or not it's central sensitization. I hope that helps, yeah. David. Yeah. Very good. And that actually is all the questions. So good, we got through everything. And, and there was just a lot of other very grateful and appreciative people. <laughs> very appreciative to them for being here. Cool. I want you to see my sweatshirt. Can you see that in the, in the camera? Yeah, I see. I, um, my, Snoopy. Snoopy, my Snoopy sweatshirt. Okay. So that's the way I feel about everybody in the audience. It's like, just give us a big hug. <laughs> and the last question I have is, why does chocolate taste good? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, well, there's two reasons. One is dark chocolate anyway. Cocoa is an anti-inflammatory. It raises endorphins. It's a good thing. Um, if patients, this is a little nerdy, but it's true. If patients like milk chocolate or chocolate that's really sweet, if they crave sugar all the time, they're trying to raise serotonin, believe it or not. Yes. So tryptophan is absorbed in the presence of carbohydrate in the gut. Tryptophan gets turned into 5-hydroxy, tryptophan gets turned into serotonin. Only way you can raise serotonin is uh, when there's carbohydrates in your gut of some sort, even complex carbohydrates. So patients that eat a quart of ice cream before noon, besides being overweight, and a little bit depressed, they're just trying to raise their serotonin levels. So well, you give them a great question. Do you know, have any protocols in general to raise serotonin and dopamine levels in a healthy way for people that say that have had some reason why they've become depleted? Oh, sure. Like, yeah, the concussion, the yeah. Like that? yeah, the concussion protocol, um, treating the midbrain is really important to reduce um, central stress. And the other thing that's totally amazing is the, that pathway between tryptophan and serotonin requires B6. There's only two spots, right? There's tryptophan, 5-hydroxy tryptophan, serotonin. B6 is an essential cofactor here. Magnesium is an essential cofactor here. You have to have both of them. Beautiful. Okay. There's a whole group of people that don't phosphorylate B6 and don't make it into the active form. So you have somebody that's got depression, either dopamine-based depression, they need probably copper, but even dopamine-based depression, B6, it's magic. Okay. Well, on that magic note of magic, we're going to end tonight. And uh, thank you for, uh, for being with us, Carolyn. Thank you, Kevin, for your help. Thank you, Darren. This has been great. I appreciate it. I've never had a webinar where we had 292 people registered and over 100 actually showed up and stayed with you the whole time. That was No amazing. way. That's amazing. Thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, good okay. night, everybody, and um, have a great rest of your week. And, again, we'll be back with another webinar February 7th. For we'll all see you then. Approach. Cool. Take care. Okay, goodbye. Good have night. Good, good night. Kevin, make it go away. Okay, here we go. Oh, you're out. There you go. You're in charge, Darren. I'm in charge. That's right. Cool. The ego really.